again Jesus began to teach by the lake. The crowd that gathered around him was so large that he got into a boat and sat in it out on the lake while all the people were along the shore at the water's edge. He taught them many things by parables and in his teaching said, Listen, a farmer went out to sow his seed. As he was scattering the seed, some fell along the path and the birds came and ate it up. Some fell on rocky places where it did not have much soil. It sprang up quickly because the soil was shallow. But when the sun came up, the plants were scorched and they withered because they had no root. Other seed fell among thorns which grew up and choked the plants so that they did not bear grain. Still other seed fell on good soil. It came up, grew and produced a crop, some multiplying thirty, some sixty, some a hundred times. Then Jesus said, Whoever has ears to hear, let them hear. When he was alone, the twelve and the others around him asked him about the parables. He told them, The secret of the kingdom of God has been given to you. But to those on the outside, everything is said in parables, so that they may be ever seeing, but never perceiving, and ever hearing, but never understanding. Otherwise, they might turn and be forgiven. Then Jesus said to them, Don't you understand this parable? How then will you understand any parable? The farmer sows the word. Some people are like seed along the path where the word is sown. As soon as they hear it, Satan comes and takes away the word that was sown in them. Others, like seed sown on rocky places, hear the word and at once receive it with joy. But since they have no root, they last only a short time. When trouble or persecution comes because of the word, they quickly fall away. Still others, like seed sown among thorns, hear the word, but the worries of this life, the deceitfulness of wealth and the desires for other things come in and choke the word, making it unfruitful. Others, like seed sown on good soil, hear the word, accept it, and produce a crop, some thirty, some sixty, some a hundred times what was sown. He said to them, Do you bring a lamp to put it under a bowl or a bed? Instead, don't you put it on a stand? For whatever is hidden is meant to be disclosed, and whatever is concealed is meant to be brought out into the open. If anyone has ears to hear, let them hear. Consider carefully what you hear, he continued. With the measure you use, it will be measured to you, and even more. Whoever has will be given more. Whoever does not have, even what they have will be taken from them. He also said, this is what the kingdom of God is like. A man scatters seed on the ground. Night and day, whether he sleeps or gets up, the seed sprouts and grows, though he does not know how. All by itself, the soil produces grain. First the stalk, then the head, then the full kernel in the head. As soon as the grain is ripe, he puts the sickle to it because the harvest has come. Again he said, What shall we say the kingdom of God is like? Or what parable shall we use to describe it? It is like a mustard seed, which is the smallest of all seeds on earth. Yet when planted, it grows and becomes the largest of all garden plants, with such big branches that the birds can perch in its shade. With many similar parables, 
Jesus spoke the word to them as much as they could understand. He did not say anything to them without using a parable. But when he was alone with his own disciples, he explained everything. If you look on your service sheet, uh, we've got the book of Mark. Uh, I've been asked already, what does season two mean? Um, season two is for those that don't watch series. Um, series, you have season one, season two, season three, season four. Uh, by definition, we are in season two of our Mark series, um, if you're going to treat it like that. Um, so we are picking up in Mark at, at Mark chapter, chapter four. And I'm not going to read through this entire passage for us. It is quite a lengthy piece, but also a familiar passage. So the reason why I'm not going to read through it is uh, it is going to take a little bit of time. Um, but I'd rather talk us through it in that sense. Um, who is familiar with these parables? If you take a glance at your Bible, there's four parables that we're going to look at there. Everybody familiar with them? The, the parable of the sower, a lamp on a stand, the parable of the growing seed, and the parable of the mustard seed. Everybody familiar with those? Yeah, yeah. Good, in, good, good, good. Okay, so then I'm not going to get into too much detail of the text and read it. But basically, if you don't know what it is, the parable of the sower is the idea of the sower sowing the seeds and then falling onto different ground. And some ground is good for growth and others is not good at all. Uh, the next one is a lamp stand or a lamp on a stand, sorry. And it is not good to put a lamp under a basket. We know in load shedding that uh, if we have a light, the last thing we'd want to do now is to put it under a basket uh, because we can't see properly as is. Um, and then there's the parable of the growing seed that there is this faithful farmer who just does his work, but the seed grows. Somehow the seed grows. And the fourth parable is the parable of the mustard seed from the smallest of seeds grows this incredible bush, this incredible tree, or whatever you want to, however you want to translate that. Um, and so we got these four pictures. Uh, me personally, I'm a little bit of a, uh, call me a perfectionist in some ways, or a, just get a little bit agitated. I wish there was something about a seed in the lampstand, uh, but there isn't, because then it would be all the seed stories, but it's not. Uh, but it's just there to keep me on my toes. So maybe you're like me. There is significance in the fact that there is this parable that is slightly different to the other ones. Um, and we're going to try and look at that in a little bit more detail. We are going to draw in, uh, draw our attention to some of these uh, stories um, that Jesus teaches. But before we do so, previously, uh, the start of last year, we looked at Mark and we basically highlighted the beginning of Jesus' ministry the start of that as he started to do things that was controversial within the society that he's in that upset the, the Pharisees, the Sadducees. Um, and then there was this idea of the, well, there's the crowds that began to follow him. Um, and so that we haven't left behind us. There is still crowds. Part of this teaching that Jesus is doing is seems to be in a boat looking out uh, from the Sea of Galilee onto the land because he can't actually stand on the shore because there are so many people crowding in on him. Um, Jesus has also, at the end of last, uh, last season, uh, Jesus was appointing the Twelve. And that's important because he's talking to the Twelve in this parable. He talks to them personally as well. And then also uh, at the end, the very final thing that we looked at uh, last time, was Jesus was accused uh, by, the fam by his family and teachers. So we really see that tension uh, that is starting to be created <clears throat> around who he is, what he's saying. And now we pick up with this incredible teaching that he gives around uh, these parables that have actually great significance around who he is. And we're going to draw our attention to that. So the start of this, uh, as I said, it begins in verse 1 where it says, Again, Jesus began to teach by the lake, and the crowd gathered around him. It was so large that he got into a boat and sat in it out on the lake, <clears throat> while all the people were along the shore at the water's edge. So despite the fact that what he has been teaching and what he has been saying has created controversy, there are still masses of people 
coming to him to hear what he has to say as his ministry um, begins. Then it carries on in verse 2, just to pick up on a few details. Uh, he taught them many things by parables, and in his teaching said, listen, and we'll get into that. Uh, that listen is important as part of his parables, uh, but the parables that he teaches, there is a reason for it. <clears throat> there is reason for him teaching in parables. You can jump down to verse 12 to actually just get the highlight, the, the highlights of why he does it. There is a quote there coming out of Isaiah. It says, um, <clears throat> as part of uh, picking up in verse 11, he said, I told them, uh, he told them, the secret of the kingdom of God has been given to you. But to those on the outside, everything is said in parables. And this is why. So that they may be ever seeing, but never perceiving, and ever hearing, but never understanding. Otherwise, they might turn and be forgiven. Now, this seems like a very bizarre statement for Jesus to be saying. He's saying it to his disciples. He's saying it to them particularly. Because they have, first and foremost, they have listened to something that Jesus has said. So as, the, as it said there in the first line of verse 3, listen is so crucial in the parables. If you listen, you are going to ask. You are going to investigate. You are going to come and find out what is meant. And so what Jesus is doing is he's teaching in parables not only to fulfill what Scripture says, but also to keep, in some senses, those that are on the outside, currently on the outside, and those that he has called in on the inside. And so the, those that are on the inside are the disciples, are those that he has called, those that have come to him, and those that listen and ask. Uh, these parables, there's another refrain. Does anybody know what that refrain is that you pick up every now and again in the parables? I hear it. I hear it. There we go. He who has an ear, or he who has ears, let him hear. And this is so important because it is calling us to listen. So as we come to these parables, let's open our ears and let's listen to what is being said. And maybe they're going to trigger questions. And that's a good thing. If you hear these parables and don't immediately grasp every detail of it, but you're curious enough to ask a question, fantastic. We should be asking. And so what he says in verse 3, he unpacks the picture. Listen to those words. He says, A farmer went out to sow his seeds. As he was scattering the seed, some fell along the path, and the birds came and ate it. Some fell on rocky places where it did, uh, where it did not have much soil. It sprang up quickly because the soil was shallow. But when the sun came up, the plants were scorched, and they withered because they had no root. Other seed fell among thorns, which grew up and choked the plants, so that they did not bear grain. Still other seed fell on good soil. It came up, grew, and produced, good, uh, and produced a crop, some multiplying 30, some 60, some 100 times. So, first thing that we pick up is there's four soils, or four grounds, that you can call it. Uh, one is on the path, one is rocky, one is... Shall, uh, one is amongst the thorns and the other one is on good soil. And it's important that we notice that the one that is obviously highlighted as a good one because it multiplies is the one on the good soil. This is something that we need to just earmark, for lack of a better way of putting it, uh, because we need to listen to what that one is really saying. And we need to come back around to it because the other parables are going to tie in with that concept that there is produce, there is uh, extra. There is an abundance in what is happening. And so we need to come back to that idea. But as Jesus teaches us, the disciples aren't quite sure outright what he is saying. Verse 9, when Jesus said, whoever has ears, there we have it, to hear, let them hear. Uh, when he was alone, the twelve and the others around him asked him about the parables. Uh, what's interesting is this is most likely not just for this parable, but for other parables as well, um, because this is just one parable that we look at here. But the fact that Jesus explains is most likely that he's explaining multiple parables as well. 
um, as he says what he says then in verse 12. It really highlights why he's teaching in parables, not just one parable, but multiple parables. Then Jesus actually explains it to the disciples, the first parable, in a little bit more detail for, for us to actually see in verse 13. And Jesus said to them, don't you understand this parable? How then will you understand any parable? The farmer sows the word. And this, this is beautifully explained, very clear, if you ever were confused. He says it straight out. The farmer sows the word. Some people are like seed along the path where the word is sown. As soon as they hear it, Satan comes and takes away the word that was sown in them. Others, like the seed sown on rocky places, hear the word and at once receive it with joy. But since they have no root, they last only a short time. When trouble or persecution comes because of the word, they quickly fall away. Still others, like seed sown among thorns, hear the word, but the worries of this life and the deceitfulness of wealth and the desires of other things come in and choke the word, making it unfruitful. Others, like the seed sown on good soil, hear the word, accept it, and produce a crop. Some 30, some 60, some 100 times what was <coughs> sown. So really, he explains it quite clearly. There shouldn't be much room for confusion. And that's kind of what's beautiful about these parables is at least the first one, we've got the answer. If you're wondering what, why this parable, Jesus explains it quite clearly. And it is fantastic what he is saying. He's saying this is the issue. These are the, the, the circumstances. And again, as I say, that last one is so important to zoom in on because that's kind of the key to understanding the other parables as well, in some sense. But everybody okay with the first parable? You know, follow? Good? Makes sense? Don't have to say much more on that. It is self-explanatory in the sense that he has explained it for us. All right. The next one is the lampstand, and this is where it becomes interesting. It feels out of place, and it feels contradictory. And this we need to maybe just pick up for a moment. It says, yeah, he said to them, do you bring in a lamp to put it under a bowl or a bed? Instead, don't you put it on its stand? For whatever is hidden is meant to be dis it, whatever is hidden is meant to be disclosed, and whatever is concealed is meant to be brought out into the open. If anyone has ears to hear, let them hear. Consider carefully what you hear. He continued, with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. And even more, whoever has will be given more. Whoever does not have, even what they have will be taken from them. So there's a, it ends with this kind of contrast. Uh, but this whole parable is a bit peculiar in the sense of, here is the light. If we understand the concept of light, the light is often the word. It is Jesus being declared. If you have that, why would you put it under a basket or under your bed? It shouldn't be something that you conceal. It be, should be something that you declare, someone that you show to the world, which is very interesting in light of what he said, why he's teaching in parables. Because in the previous parable, he actually says, they may be ever seeing but never perceiving and ever hearing but never understanding. Otherwise, they might turn and be forgiven. So it almost seems like these two parables are contrasting one another, or at least the reason why he's teaching in parables is contrasting with this parable. Obviously, there is some understanding and some history that we need to know as there is a certain time for everything. So this is not the intention, is not to contradict uh, himself in his parables, but to establish that there is a time for everything. There is a time for the word to go out to the Jews. There's a time for the word to go out to the Gentiles. That's important. And so what he is coming to declare is a word that will go out to all, but the ones that hear will be brought in. Those that are listening, those that are perceiving, those that are wanting to hear. And unfortunately, those that are not able to hear is at this point 
the Jewish leadership, those that are of the Pharisees, the Sadducees, those that are religious leaders, because it's hard for them to hear. They are so conditioned to hear what they believe is right, that they cannot hear what Jesus has come to share. And then there's the flip side of that as well, that they actually have the light. They have what they need in order to see Jesus Christ, but instead they put it under a basket themselves. And so it is actually a shocking thing that they have everything that they need to be able to hear and see and perceive, but they are covering it up. So it is also a judgment of sorts in his words that he is using here. So nowhere is he contradicting. He is actually challenging and rebuking, saying, if you actually have the light, and he is the light, don't put me under a basket. Don't cover me up. Don't silence me. Listen, perceive who I am. And so this is incredibly important as we look at the parables. The parables are there to illuminate who Jesus Christ is. Not only that, but to illuminate his power. And why do I say this? Well, part of the parables is there to illuminate the power of growth, of expansion. Notice the first parable said that 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 falls on good soil multiplies in its growth. 30, 60, sometimes 100 times. And this one as well. Whoever has will be given more. What you have will be multiplied. And this is referring to the word, to Christ, to the light. If you have the light and you use the light, you will get more of the light to share more of the light. <laughs> and so we go. And so it's actually a multiplication of the power of Jesus Christ, if I can put it that way. So the parables highlight that for us, that where the seed is sown and where it falls, depending on those soils, either has the potential to squash the word and the power of Jesus Christ and ignore it, or to make it flourish and multiply, going out to the nations, going out to the people, so that they can see, hear, perceive, believe, and be transformed by his power. Does that make sense? You good? This is actually really incredible and really just beautiful at how, if we can use how his uh, accounting works, if we can use that language. Ludwig loves the accounting language. But how Jesus' accounting works, it is a multiplication of power, a multiplication of light, a multiplication of growth, a multiplication where it is heard, where it is perceived, where people listen and ask, we are able to grow. So just pause there for a moment. Who was really good at school? Anyone want to boast for a moment? Anyone was really, really good at school? Got good marks? So, 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 so. Okay, cool. We got one. That's fine. Can, can I, can I, okay, we got two. Can I ask? Did you ask lots of questions at school? Yeah? Did you ask lots of questions? Yeah? Yes. We can chat later. I'll do that. Cool. But yeah, we ask questions. Those that ask questions are able to be open to grow, for multiplication to take place. When we kind of, where's Hilton? What's what's a what's a dumb question? Father always decide only dumb people ask dumb God questions. Yeah. So if you don't ask a question, <laughs> you fall into another category. But I'm just trying to show the contrast is those that listen, those that ask questions. The disciples come to Jesus to ask questions, to understand, to listen, to perceive. And so we do not cover it, but we go out, we explore, we want to know, we want to receive more. All right, let's look at the, the next two parables quickly. The parable of the growing seed, as we have it there. Verse 26, he also said, this is what the kingdom of God is like. A man scatters seed on the ground, night and day. Whether he sleeps or gets up, the seed sprouts and grows, though he does not know how. 
all by itself the soil produces grain first the stalk then the head and then the full kernel in the head as soon as the grain is ripe he puts the sickle to it because the harvest has come this takes us one step further into understanding the power of God's word in understanding the power of Jesus Christ we need to be faithful in declaring it. We need to be faithful in sowing. We need to be faithful in being disciples. And God will be the one that ensures that the thing grows. The power of Jesus Christ, the power of his word, the power of his light, the power of his gospel is that he will make things grow. He will make the multiplication take place. But we need to be faithful to do it. We need to be faithful to declare it. We need to be faithful in shining the light, sowing the seed, here, now even. The next parable, the parable of the mustard seed. Again he said, what shall we say? The kingdom of God is like, or what parable shall we use to describe it? It is like a mustard seed, which is the smallest of all seeds on earth. Yet when planted, it grows and becomes the largest of all garden plants, with such big branches that the birds can perch in its shade. With many similar parables, Jesus spoke the word to them, as much as they could understand. He did not say anything to them without using a parable, but when he was alone with his own disciples, he explained and so this last parable really highlights, I think what's beautiful about it is also where this word is coming from. That the seed that is going out in this time and this place, particularly for, for Jesus, for the disciples, for what they're experiencing in this world at this time, seems almost next to insignificant. For us today, we look at Christianity and we go, well, Christianity is one of the most biggest religions or faiths however you want to describe it different people will look at it in different ways but it is one of the biggest in the world so for us to really grasp the understanding of this mustard seed is slightly difficult but for Jesus in that moment he was one of the first to really he was the first one to declare and grasp and be able to communicate this not only that but where Jesus came from Everybody understood that Jesus was from Nazareth. And it was the most insignificant little place. Well, he came from Bethlehem, but everybody knew him as Jesus of Nazareth. But what's, what good comes from Nazareth? And out of this most insignificant, smallest of places, removed from Israel and what Israel would understand as being the rightful place and the right place for the right thing, Jesus comes with this mustard seed that we today look at and see the birds able to perch in its branches. Because as we look at Christianity today, in its fallibility as well in some areas, because we are human beings, but looking at it, look at how many branches there are. So we can actually get a bit of a glimpse at the end of this parable of what time has done to that mustard seed. Here we are, part of that garden plant. <laughs> You're sitting here as a bird perched on one of those branches. <laughs> Isn't that incredible? <laughs> because of Jesus. Because of the power of His Word that went out. So let's look back just for a moment. With that in mind, you catch a glimpse of what has happened when the word was not put under a basket, when the light was not concealed, and when God, through his power, made the word go out. Today, we are living in the reality of the embodiment and the joy of knowing that these parables have come true in Jesus Christ. That's amazing. We are sitting here today because somewhere in history, there have been faithful few who have held to this word. And over two, well, nearly over 2,000 years now, 
later. We are sitting here because of the faithful ones that have not concealed the light, who have trusted in the power of Jesus' word to go out. We are sitting halfway across the world, perched on a little branch here in Somerset West, in a little church called Crossword that is part of the result of the mustard seed that has been planted. Amazing. Beautiful. That is the power. That is the power of Jesus Christ. That is the power of His Word. This is all still a little bit theoretical. But I am going to stop there for today. Because next week we're going to look at the practical aspects of the power of Jesus Christ. And I don't want to jump the gun. So come back next week because it gets really exciting when Jesus really demonstrates his power through action. This is demonstrating it through parables, through words. And Jesus is going to go on next week, well, not on next week, for us, as we look at it next week. And we are going to see his power working out in people's lives, in circumstances, and it is incredible. Because we are sitting here today and we can testify to that because we are here today. And we're going to see even more so next week. So may you be encouraged this week, if anything. Maybe you're sitting here with a, with a bit of doubt, uncertainty as to whether God's word truly does have power. Whether God really does have the authority. Whether Jesus Christ has really done something that is worth Declaring, the fact that you are here is evidence of that. Listen to his word. Be faithful. Declare it. Enjoy it. Enjoy him. Because he has done it. Through his life, his death, and his resurrection, the power of Christ has become known for us. What a joy it is that we get to be here today, part of this body. May the seeds that you have be sown and continue to be sown. And may he grow that and continue to expand his kingdom, continue to spread his word, his light through you. Because I don't think he's done yet. I don't think Jesus is done growing his kingdom. We, we, we're the halfway mark. I think this, this, this garden plant needs to get a lot bigger. There's still a lot more people that need to know. We're the halfway mark. So let's continue to shine that light. Let's continue to declare his faithfulness, his power, and his goodness. Let's pray. Amen. Gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for Jesus Christ. We thank you for just being able to sit here and recognize that we are part of something truly incredible. And Father, I pray that we may be faithful in declaring your word, that we may be faithful in sharing and spreading your light in this world, that you may continue to grow and multiply your kingdom through the faithful and obedient hearing of your word. Thank you, Father, that here in Crossword Church, in Somerset West, in South Africa, is just a tiny aspect of that reality. So far from where it started, here we sit and we declare you. We declare Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior of lives, that you can rescue us from sin and death, that you are the one that we can seek for the true answer to life's predicament. And as we turn to you, Father, we pray that we may uh, declare you to whoever we are able to, without shame, without fear, but with absolute joy in knowing you. Thank you, Father, for, for your grace. Thank you for your mercy all these years. 
that after 2,000 years, you are still growing your kingdom. Thank you that you have not given up. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.